Uh, today we talk about perceptions and misperceptions. I think it will be after several weeks of teaching, I, I found out some students do not uh, really master the skills of readings. I always advise the students to to know the outline to to provide yourself a micro perspective on how how the reading is structured. It's very important. So um, I will try to give you some idea about my idea, my observation of the macro structure of this reading, this article to you first. So uh, before we have our break in five minutes, so it's maybe a good time for me to go over the structure for you so you can have a better idea, okay? So let's look at what, what is about this lecture. Uh, first of all, you have to uh, look at the four different questions first. The four questions list here, you, you can just go over your reading and you will understand, you, you will try to find out the, the paragraph, the sections uh, review, review the same information there. So basically there are four different questions. It, uh, these questions always intrigue, always intrigue a lot of political scientists when they discuss how those elites make decisions for us how they make important decisions to uh, govern, the gov govern the nation around the governmental business and so on. So basically there are some uh, issue here. First one, for example, what are the causes and the consequences of misperceptions? Uh, we are not really in a good position to say, okay, I always make the right decision. Sometimes people don't. People always do things wrongly, always. He will be amazed to find out. And what kind of perceptual errors commonly occurred in the decision making? Imagine this, when we are trained, uh, everyone in this class, of course you would like to have a better future, right? You want to have a brighter future for yourself. So you will study hard, you will work hard, trying to become one of the elites. And becoming elites does not guarantee you uh, you, you can exempt from the making mistakes. Still, you will make a lot of mistakes too. Okay, uh, that's strange. And also, how are beliefs about politics and images of other actors formed and altered? Let's look at here. And uh, the President Trump has a lot of uh, actions against China. China's President Xi over there, right? Why and how? How 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 they perceive? Uh, China in this way. And uh, what are the Chinese perceptions toward the United States? It, it's kind of intriguing. A lot of time, war does not cause by rational calculation. It was caused by misperception. It was caused. Uh, it, it, so war is dangerous. War will cause life. People will die, right? But still, we have experience Historically, of course, not, our, not in our generation. We never experienced war. And uh, I'm not so sure about some of the foreign students there. But in Taiwan, we have no war at all. But you can imagine this. But why the people always have a regional conflict? And uh, they still. And the first question, how do decision makers draw inferences from information? Imagine, do you want to make your decision? We need to have information, right? But imagine this, when, how do we take information into our consideration? Especially at the time when the information are contradictory to us. Yes, it's contradictory to our belief. So it's very difficult. This are all the questions raised in the beginning of this. And the author uh, prop out to uh, two different schools the experts in international relations and the experts in uh, psychologist, psychology. And of course, though the two schools, the, the experts from the two schools do not fully explain why, why this question, they do not provide a full answer, satisfied answer yet. For experts in international relations, they always assume one thing, here is a very important one, that they always in perceive usually those people, those people who decide on behalf of us, be on behalf of us, they always perceive the word quite accurately. 
but which is not true, which is not true. But let always assume that. And those misperceptions that do occur, if there is something really occur, they're just random accidents. They do not do this on purpose, in other words. Okay, it is seems to, to burn, to land, right? Because they are, always, they are also people. People make errors. So this book, the, 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 the article of the book, argued that this kind of view is incorrect. Okay? Incorrect. So, and we need to know this, because people will always do, and why do we need to understand this? Because this knowledge can be used not only to explain a specific decision. There are many, many occasions need our understanding of the word, how the word is really working. So basically, okay, let's take a 10 minutes break and back again to continue the structure for you. So let's go over the structure one more time. I will, be, I will do this in a quick way. Uh, I, be, I found that it was too slow for the previous five minutes. So basically, there are four questions raised in the beginning of this article, right? And the four questions, you, you just go over your reading and find out, find out the, set, the, the passage of the four questions up there. So there are some questions. They are very important for us to understand how the word is constructed, how the word, how all those makings are made. However, sometimes our perceptions are not really right. So those are questions not really answered by experts from international relations or psychologists. And uh, there's an assumption from the experts for international relations. They always assume they are right. Those people who make decisions for us are always right, but this is not right. Okay, so we try to find out the answer why they always make some a lot of mistakes. And uh, not only experts for international relations made mistakes, they do not provide a satisfied answers for us to understand how people make decisions. And even those psychologists, they have reasons, but their reasons is a little bit better, but not sufficient yet either. Okay, so, because why psychology, if, look at this, psychologists are supposed to study anything related to our psychological factors, right? However, they are still, they, they still did not provide good answers for us. Why? Because there are five major faults. So I want to, I want you to go over the passage to highlight the five major points over there. And so you will know they, are, they offer discussion. This article offers discussion on the five major faults. The first one is about more attention on emotional than cognitive factors. They emphasize how people get angry and so on. So this is the first one. First, more attention is paid to emotional than cognitive factors. First one. And the next one is second. Almost all data supporting the theories are derived from laboratory experience, not from our daily life environment settings. So they experiment from laboratory. So this is the second one, okay? And how about the third one? The third argument is a strong policy bias there. They always pr they, they prey down the conflict of interest, the third. And how about the fourth? The fourth is that uh, the structure, dangers, and opportunities of international assistance peculiar to the setting are often overlooked or misunderstood. So they, they, they don't care, they neglect it. What happened? The structure, dangers, and the opportunities that, that are important to international settings, they just take it away. So this is overlooked, number five. And how about the last point? That, that point is a little bit far away from the readings. It is, they do not account how highly intelligent people look at things, how those people analyze, analyze the difficult and complex matters. Because their studies 
most of the psychology studies are on ordinary people, not on those highly intelligent people who make decisions for us, right? Okay, so these are the major five major faults. And the last part as a conclusion is, to, that is, a, is a little bit talking about the theory. What, how do we look at theory? What is the purpose of theory? Theory itself is a simplified version of complex reality. So immediately, it would be very difficult for us to describe the complexity of the whole reality, right? So most of the time, we, we will use a very simple theory to observe. That's it. So basically, the structure of the reading is uh, very simple. One, the first one, the author pop out four different questions and tried to look for answers, look for answers from the two different kinds of experts. Experts from international relations and experts from psychology. And he found out that experts of international relations pray down, always assume those elites, when they make decisions, they always make a correct decisions, but which is wrong, right? And so he turned to look at the answers from psychologists. Psychologists, they, indeed, they do more studies than uh, experts in international relations, but they did not provide satisfied answers either. Why? Because there are five major issues out there. And we can go back to look at the five major faults. The first one, they always emphasize on emotional factors. Emotional factors, not cognitive factors. And the second one is the, the most of the study, most of the experiences learned from psychology, psychological studies are from laboratory, not from the real life settings. And the third one is that there's a strong policy bias exists over there when they analyze. And the third one is that the very important structures, dangers and opportunities inside the international relations, international settings are often overlooked by psychologists because they are not experts in this field, right? And the fifth, fifth one is they do not study enough about how those intel highly intelligent people do their decision, make their decisions. So these are the five major. And uh, in the last part of the article, the author provides why even the psychologist cannot provide answers for us to understand the difference between misperception and perception. It is because we always try to look for some sort of theory. And what is the purpose for having a theory? Because we always, always try to search for a simplified version of a complex reality. It would be very difficult for us to understand the whole complexity of the reality, right? So this is the whole structure of the article. So first, let's go back to the questions first. So basically, this is the online for, our, for us to study for today. We talk about perceptions and the misperceptions. And uh, basically, it's adequate, inadequately understood for its importance in policy making nowadays. We always believe that we can make the right decisions. But still, we take in information, we analyze the information, and we make our decision. A lot of time, we just do it wrongly, okay? And the second part uh, and the third part is English etymology and also today we move on to talk about a little bit about punctuations. Punctuation seems very easy but it is very difficult sometimes. And uh, we have uh, our assignments. First, let's look at the four questions pop out by the author. What are the causes and the consequences of misperception? You can look at here. Ideally, we try to make correct decisions, right? To make a right decision, we must perceive correctly about the settings we encounter. But if you are making your decision, if you made your decision 
which is based on a wrong information or wrong perception of what would happen. But why? We try to avoid, right? We try to make correct decisions, but for most of the time, we make wrong decisions. So basically, have you ever thought about this question? What are the causes and what are the consequences of misperception? Because lives, in terms of international politics, a lot of time, right? And the second one, what kind of perceptual errors commonly occurred in decision making? When you make a decision, you, of course you, uh, you, you will believe in something. That's why you make up your decision. You make your decision based on your beliefs, your norms, and your values, and the information you have collected, right? But a lot of time, you will make errors. So what kind of perceptual errors you just perceive wrongly? What kind of errors when you make a decision? Have you ever thought about this? You are, you are making decision to do it. You are making decisions every day, actually. You make decisions every day, right? Including what kind of breakfast you want to go. Or whether you want to skip Daniel's class. <laughs> Again, there are a lot of perception decisions out there. And when you make your decision, you are based on your perceptions. What if your perceptions are wrong and we can call it a misperception? Well, it can cause some problem for you, right? And how our beliefs about politics and uh, images, of, images of other actors formed and altered? What is politics? Politics is a complexity in a political setting, right? It could be very, very complicated. And people with different political ideology have different perceptions on the same reality. It's true. Let's look at what happened in Taiwan. Pan Blue supporters and the Pan Green supporters have diff very different political ideologies in terms of whether they want to love President Tsai Ing wen or not. Is that right? Oh, the same applies in the United States, in many other countries. Pre President Trump is liked and uh, in the meantime is hated by a lot of different people. And those people do have different political ideologies. So a person's value is judged not by himself, but just by the different political ideologies. It's, it's kind of interesting, right? Okay, so those are the beliefs. Those are the beliefs formed. We have different idea about uh, how a political setting should be operated. How a person standing over there should be identified. So those beliefs are formed and altered by some mysterious causes. Have you ever thought about this? Uh, again, right? Very interesting. And also, how do decision makers draw inferences from information? We identify the problem. We collect information. We analyze information. So basically, we count down information to make our decision, right? But have you ever encountered a scenario that is the information you have collected is really contradictory, contradicting to your belief? You believe in this such a way, but the information just tell you otherwise. How can you draw, how will you draw inference from such a kind of information? And it will be very difficult. Everything you believe suddenly was just wrong under this set of information. So all of this, we have to make decision. Once we make our decision, once the decision is made, then there will be consequences. To the individual level, if you decide to invest, for example, a certain stock, and you believe that it will just go up, but on, uh, just, uh, on the opposite, it just goes down. What happens to that is consequences, right? You suffer financial, financial loss. And what about a uh, state? If a uh, state leader makes a decision, and uh, if he or she makes the wrong decision, the consequences will be only severe, more severe than we can imagine, right? 
So making decision and uh, the influence of such decisions always there. We are making decision all the time. And all of the questions here. Experts from different fields are always trying to uh, find the answers, of course, right? And unfortunately, unfortunately, so far, these questions have not been adequately discussed by specialists in either psychology or international relations. When we talk about making a decision on the state level, it's uh, related to international relations, right? And as a political scientist myself, ironically, I have been trained to believe elites are better than ordinary person, people. But in the reality, not quite so. Not quite so. Elites are, a lot of time, they make mistakes too, right? So let's look at, we know that specialists in either psychology or international relations do not have a very good answers to this. Let's look at us, we. We are, I am, somewhat, at least I can call myself a semi-spiritualist in international relations, right? I always assume, assume that the decision makers usually perceive the world quite accurately. I assume they are, they are smart. They are edu highly educated, highly ed intelligent people, right? They have been through the, in the United States Ivy League, in Taiwan, we have a National Taiwan University, and we have a, a trained through the elite educational system. So they must be better than the ordinary people, right? So they should make good decisions for us. So we are soon. But what happens if those misperceptions that do occur, sometimes they do have some misperception about things, well, can only be treated as random accidents. It just happens. Just as Forrest Gump, he said, shits happened. <laughs> not, not, not shits happened, it's just, just there. We, we cannot avoid, right? We cannot avoid this kind of accidents. Well, so it's kind of, why we say this? Because we don't think that is important to analyze this kind of difference between perception and misperception. But in reality, it is wrong. It is wrong. So that is why this book seeks to demonstrate this view is incorrect. This view is totally wrong. This view is totally wrong. Why? <clears throat> the author argued, perception of the world and of other actors diverge from reality in patterns. So our perception toward the world and toward the other actors diverge from reality. Normally, we, I believe you are this, but in reality, you are not. We believe the world is happening in this direction, but in reality, it is not. So this is called, we call diverge. Diverge in reality, from reality in patterns. There are many, many different kinds of patterns we can detect. Actually, if we try hard, we can understand there are differences out there. The difference between reality and our, our perception toward the reality is different. Just like you, right? You look at me, Daniel, reality. Your perception about Daniel and uh, Daniel himself, sometimes they are just different, right? And uh, most of the students, when the first time they look at me, I believe I'm not humorous at all. I'm very serious and I could be very cruel sometimes. But this is your perception toward me. But in reality, I can be, I can tell jokes, okay? And uh, I'm kind. <laughs> Do you that? Yeah, I'm kind, yes, I, I mean, I'm kind. I can be humorous too. So I, I can tell jokes, really. So re the real Daniel and your perception of the Daniel is quite a, a little bit different, right? Okay, so this kind of divergence be between reality and your perceptions can detect, and for reasons that we can understand. It, it's quite simple, straightforward. We know the differences are always there. No one is naive enough 
No one will be so naive to believe that their perceptions and the reality are just about the same. No one, no one said that, right? So it's our human nature. We know our understanding about the world and the world itself will be different in many, many different ways. Okay, so basically we can find both misperceptions that are common to diverse kinds of people and there are important differences in perceptions that can be explained without delving too deeply into individual psyches. So we do not need to spend a lot of effort to distinguish, try to identify this kind of differences. No, we just have, we just walk out the door and find out there are a lot of differences between perceptions and reality. You don't have to do a lot of efforts over that. And you don't have to study many, many so that you understand, oh, oh, so people perceive the reality in a quite different ways. Oh, so amazing, I just found out. No, no, you don't, you don't need to do this. It, it's so plain easy, right? So this knowledge referred to the understanding between the reality and the perception. There are many, many differences. So this kind of understanding about the differences between reality and the perceptions not only help us to explain specific decisions, but also to account for patterns of interaction. People interact, right? Why they interact in the very bizarre way, very difficult way, right? Have you seen a, a, a if, if you, if you, uh, if you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to observe the interactions of a man and a woman in a, in a, in a restaurant. And then they dine in front of each other, right? Their interactions can tell you a lot of story, whether they are staying in love, or whether they treat this as just a formality for their dinner. So you can see a lot, all right? So this kind of patterns of interaction can help you. You can, if you have the understanding, this knowledge about the reality, and the difference between reality and the perception, then you can train yourself to understand a lot of different patterns between human beings, right? And also that it can help, it can improve our general understanding of international relations. So the knowledge of knowing the differences between perception and reality is very important which means that people do misperceive a lot of issues. Okay, so keep that knowledge. We can use this kind of knowledge to understand people's interaction. We can use this to, to know why people make such a decision. We can use this knowledge to understand how states interact among themselves and to establish their relationship among themselves. Okay, so it's very useful, right? So unfortunately, experts from the international relations do not provide good answers for the why people have different, uh, or why there are differences between perceptions and reality. Okay, and how about, so if we cannot find out an answers from experts of international relations, so we go to ask for the psychologist. So here, so we ask if, scholars trained in international relations have paid little attention to perceptions. The same cannot be said for psychologists. That's their business, right? Psychologists. Psychologists are supposed to study perceptions, mind, spiritual actions, right? So we say that experts for international relations, they, do not, they are not trained for this purpose. Fine, but how about psychologists? They should, right? But, here is a very big but. But, why their work is extremely variable? Of course, we cannot deny psychologist analysis on perceptions are variables. But, 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 still, it is marred by five major faults. There are five major problems out there, and we need to pay attention to. So here, the, the rest of the article uh, discussed the five major faults out there. So let's start from the first one. The first one is about 
the deep emotional factors and the cognitive factors. Cognitive factors, let's look here. Emotional, let's talk about your emotion, right? So, MOT here. MOT refers to move. Well, there are many different forms of MOT. MOT, MOV, uh, or MOB. O R M O V E move. So emotional. It means that E out. So from inside and you move out your feeling. So that is an emotion. Okay, emotional. So like another word. For example, uh, we have a mobile. Mobile move of moving. So mobile automobile. Automobile, auto refers to self. So if we call a car as an automobile, the, a car can move by itself, right? So automobile. And let's look at the cognitive. Here, C-O-G-N, the, the Latin, the meaning for the root is to know to know. So you can see here, cognitive. Cognitive means of knowing, of knowing. So knowing refers to your reasons, your idea, you know this. For example, there's another word, recognize. C-O-G-N is to know, right? And how about R E? R is again. Is again all oh, back. And I Z E is a uh, suffix for verb, verb ending. So it is, if you know something back, know something again, you recognize, you admit. You admit this. Okay, you recognize this one again. So if this is yours, you recognize it is yours. So it, it is something you know again. Okay. So basically, let's try to identify the difference between emotional and cognitive. Emotional is a moving of your feeling out. Moving out your feeling is a emotion. And how about cognitive? It's based on reason, based on reasons. So if you sit down and cold, keep yourself calm, and you think, you try to understand, you try to know things, right? So, psychological analysis, we found out that more attention is paid to emotional than cognitive factors. Okay? This is the first fault. So, what about emotional factors? There are several issues. For example, wishful thinking, defense mechanism, and other motivated distortion of reality are focused on to a relative exclusion, exclusion, you try to exclude. They talk more about wishful thinking, defense mechanism, and other motivated distortion of reality. But it's trying to exclusion the problem of how even a perfectly unemotional and a careful person will go about drawing inferences from highly ambiguous evidence in a confusing and a confused world. They have a lot of study on how people to think, wishful thinking, just I hope something will become true, this kind of wishful thinking. But how about defense mechanism? A good example of defense mechanism is, the definition of defense mechanism is a way of thinking to help yourself to feel better, basically. For example, uh, if you uh, got a score. Uh, if you, if you, you got a score from your quiz, you just uh, have uh, five points. And <laughs> the maximum is 100, you got, just got a five, right? So one of the mechanisms, self-defense defense mechanism will be will play out in a way. Oh, that's not the problem. It, it's, well, I just happened I don't have time, sorry. Defense mechanism. To provide a good reasons to defend yourself from emotional harm. So this is defense of mechanism, okay? And uh, other motivated distortions of reality. 
and the reality is there why we try to understand the curve. When we try to understand it in a correct way, and psychologists always try to understand, try to study why they perceive the world so different, and why they perceive the way in such a distorted fashion. So these are the issues, and these are the focus of four psychological studies. And look at this, all of these are related to your mental status, right? So we are talking about emotional issues. Instead of why those people, they are so calm, they are so unemotional, they are so careful. And they do not, psychologists, do not spend too much study on why those people and how those people make decisions in such a confusing and a confused words, right? Because they need to draw inferences from the different information. And psycholog psychologists do not spend too much research on this. Instead, they would like to talk about emotional factors only, okay? And uh, why this is the important to look at uh, even the how even a perfect unemotional and a careful person will go about drawing inferences from highly ambiguous evidence. Ambiguous. Amb means two. Ambiguous means obscure. Obscure. It is not clear evidence. So basically, when we do make our decision. We do not count down a perfect set of information. Sometimes we just have information, no matter how ambiguous it is, we even have to make our decision, right? Then why and how we make such a decision? Psychologists don't pay too much attention to this. Okay? But when psychologists emphasize on a lot of emotional factors, emotional studies, when they refuse or not refuse, we can, I cannot use the word refuse, when they do not pay too much attention on study for cognitive factors, there are some flaws. As Robert Epperson has noted, a Yale scholar, he said, there are plenty of cold cognitive factors which produce inaccurate world views. What is cold cognitive factors? Well, if we compare to hot emotional factors, then you will understand cognitive factors supposed to be cold, more rational, right? But ironically, we know if you are hasty, if you are angered, if you are not happy about something, and most of the time you would make a wrong decision, right? But, but the reality is this. Even if you are cold enough to think over, you still make wrong decisions. You still make wrong decisions. You think over, you consider all the factors out there, and you make up your decisions. You are coding now, right? But you still make wrong decisions. You still perceive the word wrongly. Unfortunately, psychologists do not pay too much attention on this possibility. Have you ever, have you had this kind of experience? You think over, you try to collect all the necessary information, you believe that you are making, you have made the right decision, but it turned out the decision itself is totally wrong. And the psychologists do not pay attention to this. They pay a lot of attention to those emotional factors because they are, those emotional factors are easier to analyze, are easier to study. Is that right? Okay, so this is the first fault that when we apply psychological study to for our for us to understand how people make decisions in international relations is not quite sufficient. Number one, okay? More emotional, more emotional factors are studied. The second one is that 
Most of the studies, psychological studies, are based on laboratory observations. This is the second issue. So here, second. Almost all the data supporting the theories of psychological studies are derived from laboratory experiments. It, it is true. It is true. Okay? And uh, let's look at here. We, we say that most of the data supporting the theory are from the laboratory. And let's examine what's wrong with the laboratory. Whether these settings and the manipulation that are employed reveal the process that are at work in the real world is hard to determine. The problem here is that we have two different settings. One is the laboratory. The other one is the real world. Okay? So whatever we have in throughout the experiment, when we conduct the experiment in the laboratory, then we have to ask one very important question. That is, the settings of the laboratory. The manipulations we have conducted inside the laboratory, these are very different from the real world, from what we have, we would encounter in the real world, right? So basically, what we have in the what we have observed from the laboratory cannot cannot be directly applied to the real world. What happened? What it would happen in the real world? So this is a very, very difficult issue for us. So imagine this. If we just simply apply the conclusion from psychological studies, which are mainly from the laboratory experiments, and apply the studies, their findings, into our understanding about the real world, that would be dangerous. Is that right? Very strange. But most of the time, we count down their observations. And we believe that it would just happen the same in the real world. But it's not real. So this is the first consideration that we need to pay attention to. How about the second one? Even harder to gauge is whether the inferences discovered in the laboratory are strong enough to make themselves felt and they fail in the same way when they are intermixed with the other powerful variables that affect political decision making. For example, in a laboratory experiment, if I give you, a, for example, if I ask 10 uh, subjects sitting in one classroom, and I give you an incentive of uh, motivation, give you some encouragement, and you will respond to my encouragement positively, right? So, oh, okay, if I give you a good incentive, then you will react positive to my experiment. It seems that this is the finding I have from the laboratory experiment. And I can draw the inferences from the experiment saying, by saying that people like to be encouraged, okay? But were this really applied to a real world? Not really. Because if I, if I in a real world, in a real classroom, I give you the same incentive, you may not respond accordingly. Why? Because when you are in a laboratory setting, you know you are under experiment, right? So you were dutifully, most of the people, were dutifully just react to the, to the manipulation. But how about in a real world, in a real classroom, you have many, many other considerations playing out out there, right? You may feel hungry at that time when I give you the incentive. You may feel dizzy and like to take a nap when I give you the incentive, right? So imagine this. What happened in the laboratory may, can, may not be able to duplicate in the real world. So it is very difficult. It's very difficult. And it's very difficult for us to evaluate whether the same scenario can be applied. When, even though it can be applied in the laboratory, we have no guarantee that this kind of results 
will repeat, uh, will be repeated in the real world. So this is the second issue. So here, for example, very few experiments give the subjects incentive to perceive accurately. Yet this is the prime concern of decision makers. And this is very interesting. That is, a lot of psychological studies emphasize on the study of misperceptions. They use a distorted fact to feed into the subject, ask them to respond. But in real world, let's look at ourselves. When we make decision, we love to perceive correctly, right? But psychological studies do not pay attention to this. There are very, very few. So perceiving things correctly should be the prime, prime concern for us. For us, we, the decision makers, we should be. Okay, but the problem is that psychological studies don't take about this. So the application, the findings from the laboratory, its application of the findings from the laboratory has a long way to go when we want to apply in the real world. So the differences between laboratory and the real world is so huge. So if we count down the findings from the laboratory experiment, and then if instantly we know it is dangerous for us to apply those findings in the real world, right? So the discrepancy, the differences between these two is so huge. So this is the second fault that psychological studies cannot answer. Okay, the second one. Any questions so far? Let's move to the third. Third is the strong policy bias there. The strong bias policy bias existing in a form of the psychological, psycho, psychological studies do not emphasize too much on the conflict of interests. They don't. So third, a strong policy bias pervades most of the analyses. Psychological psychologists do not pay too much attention about the issue for interests. Okay, let's talk about interest itself. What is the definition of interest? Interest denotes to the benefits that you want to have you are interested in to have, to uphold, right? And what do you prefer something to others? Why? It's not easy to, it's not just enough to say, okay, because I have a specific interest on this. No. Your interest come out from your value system. Your interest come out from your value system. Is that right? Because you have been trained you have been educated too. So basically, basically, it would be very difficult to understand why people have a certain interest. If we really want to identify a person with certain interests, we need to go back to his or her early days to know what is the process of his or her socialization. How he become, basically, how he becomes such a person today. That's why he has such interests, right? Okay? And it will be very difficult. So it will, since it is very difficult to understand your interest, let alone the conflict of interest. So basically, the element of conflict of interest is played down. We always assume that as a decision makers in international relations, we know things. So we can compromise. We can rationally compromise for our interests. So when the compromise of interest is there, then the conflict of interest should not be emphasized. We have a conflict. Yes. OK. So basically, the element of conflict of interest play down in international relations in general. We, we don't talk too much about this and especially in the Cold War in particular. Interna experts in international relations, when they look at 
cold war they they used to divide the world just into to block the east and the west the east and the west it seems quite easy to look at world in this way right but if we look at the west itself the west is a huge block right but but are the interests of the west all the same no even the block the east the west block different nations have different national interests over there so if we look at the conflict of interest then we need to provide more analysis on this regard it produce, it will produce, produce more confusions that is when we look at the west block we always assume they are standing on the same side because they have the same interests but if we look deeper we find out that they do have a lot of conflict on their interests too they do they have different emphases they have different requirements they have their different mandates out there so conflict of interest is very important however psychologists do not pay too much attention on this analysis too difficult okay this is number 3 and number 4 number 4 is talking about the structure dangers and opportunities of international system this basically comes out it comes out from the policy bias we always like to look at the same interest size so we assume they are about the same if we assume people in the international relations are about the same then we will certainly overlook the basic structures and the dangers and opportunities peculiar to this setting basically they are often overlooked and misunderstood okay in what way let's see this one so this as a result of these four weaknesses this literature contains a great deal of over psychologizing uh, here is a very interesting phrase here over psychologizing that is we tend to analyze the interaction from the psychological perspectives we provide a lot of psychological reasoning to the analysis of internet analysis uh, to the analysis of international relations but basically this is too wrong, wrong. and uh, over psychologizing what is that what it says those are the explanations those are the explanations usually highly critical of the decision maker so when we look at the decision maker we say that his decision is rational, is reckless, is unreasonable. And we critical, criticize how they make the wrong decisions. And involving many psychological variables are given for behavior that are explained more convincingly by analytical analysis. So trying to give a lot of psychological studies, but, but in, as a matter of fact, if we simply, if we try to, if we only emphasize on political analysis, analysis, maybe we could have more answers on that. that. One, let's look at the political analysis. What is the basic elements for politics? When we talk about politics, there is only one word we need to pay attention to. Power. Power. The struggle of power is the essence of politics. Indeed. So if we emphasize, if we look at the political analysis, we will look at how the shift of the power from one place to another place. How the struggles of the power is compete among different factors. It may be more useful, right? 
So if you only look at the psychological factors to say, okay, because the decision maker was thinking in this certain way, and because that decision maker was helpful for something, maybe not quite so. A lot of time, it would be much easier for us to provide a whole picture. The analysis of the whole picture with political analysis, that would be much easier. Much easier, right? Okay, so for example, in Taiwan, there are several major polit political parties competing for power right now, right? And the ruling party here now is DPP. And uh, if you look at deeper, you will find out that DPP has taken a lot of actions against the KMT. Do you really want to look at the, those actions from the psychological factors? Because the leaders of the DPP hate the DPP, the KMT? Not really. If you over psychologizing the factors of the, the, the differences, the hate between the member, the elites of the two political parties, that may be misleading. But if you look at the differences between the two parties through the political analysis, the answer may be much easier for you to understand. Power. Okay, let's take a break. So we just, we just, we just uh, analyzed the, the difference between political analysis and the psychological analysis. Sometimes if we over-psychologize our understanding about the real world, Sometimes we are misled. The conclusion is misleading to some extent. A lot of time we can just easily use political analysis for us to understand how power is shifted from one place to another. Very simple. So psychological analysis may not be required. And sometimes it's over, it's too much, too much. And the more specific psychological analysis has a, a problem. That is, let's ask, in the international realm, in the, in the international setting, if we do not have a ruler, so there's a little comprehension of the consequences of the lack of, of, the lack of a sovereign, a, a queen, a king, or a ruler for one state. What would happen? And also, there is a very little analysis about their reasons. What kind of reason? Why well, even highly rational decision makers often conclude that they must be extremely suspicious and mistrustful. Even those highly trained people, those highly rational decision makers, they always complain about that, that they, they are confused about, and they, they are mistrustful among one another. And this kind of analysis are very, very, very insufficient. So that's why we need to, uh, to think about that. Maybe for, for the enrichment of our understanding about international relations, psychological analysis may not be enough. We need to count down other analysis too, right? Okay? Oh, Wake up. And the same apply to your right. Okay. Well, wake up. Don't waste your money. You will. So that. One time we did the math about how much money you spend in one class, right? It's around one fifty dollars. Thank you if you want to donate that money to the fund of the IA. That you are welcome. <laughs> you are welcome to do so. But don't do that. Your, your parents paid the money for you. Okay. So all of this, all of this, psychological analysis may be good, but not, not necessary to be a part in, in all occasions, right? So please, don't over-psychologize everything happened in international relations. And this kind of biases, of course, they try to use all the, their analysis to understand what happened in the international realm. But this kind of biases also lead psychologists 
to analyze only the views of those statesmen with whom they have little sympathy. Which means that if I were the psychologist and you are the president of one nation and we are friends, I will not analyze you. Why? Because it is kind of not friendly, right? So I will only analyze those people, those statesmen, which I have no idea at all, which I have no sympathy about their scenario, their positions. Because I believe that in this regard, I will not make enemy, right? So this can and to refrain from using their theories to treat the policy references to of those who with whom they agree. If I, I am on your same side, most of the time I will not analyze you because I want to provide my re policy recommendation to you, right? So imagine this, if psychologist analysis only focus on the people they have no friends, no friendship, they have no sympathy, they have no interest linkage at all. And this kind of analysis will be on a very hard line, right? No soft, no hard. So this kind does. So here comes the result. Thus, images and reasoning drawn from the Hanai approach to foreign policy. This is Hanai approach. That's, I don't know you, so I analyze you. Right, right? Basically, it's just about the same. I have, I have no pity on you, so analyze you. But if you were my friend, I would not analyze you. Why? Because I don't want to antagonize you, because we are friends, right? So you can make this. All the analyses are based on this kind of hard mind approach. And this can show uh, some kind of problem. That they are examined to show the operational emotional influences and cognitive process that would inhibit intelligent decision making. And this kind of is kind of bias, right? Tilt to another kind of difficult observation. It's just very really wrong. Arguments and a belief system that support conciliation are never analyzed in these terms. So of course, if you just keep yourself objective, unbiased from the setting, because you are not the friends of the people you analyze. So suppose that you can provide objective analysis, right? But your focus on what's wrong. On the analysis of what happened wrongly over there. But a lot of time, when we talk about international relations, it's not only about conflict. A lot of time it's about conciliation. We try to make friends, right? People with different interests would make friends. And the process of a conciliation is never analyzed in these ways. This is the problem. So when we talk about international relations, you have to imagine this. It's not only about conflicts. It's not, not only about wars. They are also diplomacy, they are also mediation, the mediation, they are also a lot of conciliation among different players, right? They are also important. But this kind of conciliations are not never analyzed with this kind of objective manners. That's the problem, okay? So we need to look at the structure of the international relation, international settings. And inside the setting, there are dangers, there are opportunities. Dangers are caused by different interests, the different in conflict of interest. But how about the opportunities? Opportunities are derived from the understandings of those policymakers they believe. They can work together to make a better life, better future. So henceforth, we have conciliations among the different players, right? So when we try to analyze conciliations, we still need to use the same approach that those psychologists apply to analyze the conflict of interest, right? Okay, but unfortunately, conciliation is seldom studied by in this way, okay? 
And uh, number five, most of the psychologists, psychological studies focus on ordinary, on the, on the study of ordinary persons, people. Just uh, people walking on the street every day, you can see, right? But who make the decisions for us in terms of international settings? Who? Of course, must be those highly intelligent people, right? Highly intelligent people. Their ways of thinking may some may be somewhat different from that of the ordinary part people. But unfortunately, unfortunately, psychological studies pay little attention to that. There are, there are reasons, of course. Because, of course, they are tremendously more mundane people than elites. Is that right? It's much easier to study ordinary people than to study elites. So that's the problem. So here comes the number five major fault. As grave as these defects are, they are less troubling and less hard to ratify than the fifth. So number five is very, very difficult. And it will ratify means to amend, to change, to make it better. It's a very, very different. What is this? Most of the psychological theories, and especially those that have been applied to international relations, do not count. Do not count for the ways that highly intelligent people think about problems that are crucial to them. Highly intelligent people, they become the decision makers for us. They are highly trained, highly educated. To some extent, they are elites in their society. So their ways of thinking may be somewhat different from our, ours, right? Of course, they still make mistakes. But psychological studies do not really specialize on the analysis of their ways of thinking. They do not account for. They just assume they will just do the same thing as ordinary people do. And since they do not come, and a few of the experiments that provide the bulk of the empirical evidence for the theories have been directed to the questions. And they do not study enough, and there are not sufficient empirical evidences or findings that can help us to understand how those people, how those highly intelligent people think about issues, make decisions for us rather instead of the rather theories about the formation and change of belief have been constructed around beliefs that are relevant relative and important to that per, to the person we try to establish theories about beliefs of course but this kind of construction is is, is a little, is a very little relevant to the beliefs of those intelligent people. So, we try to provide theories, and those theories are about which has little information, the person which has little information, what is the person? The person, the person who is highly intelligent. Those people, you have no idea about how they, what they are and how they will conduct issues. And also for which the consequences of being right or wrong are only minor. For the ordinary people, it's not so important to know how they make decisions. Why? Because the inferences, the consequences, whether it is right or wrong, will only influence the individual himself. But how about those highly intelligent people? They become the elites for us, the elites for the state. When they make decisions, the consequences influence a lot of people. And this kind of study are not sufficient. It's not sufficient at all. Why? Because as a scholar, we always try to identify some sort of theory, right? Can you establish a theory for those in, from those highly intelligent individuals? Very difficult. Why? Because the number of those highly intelligent persons is much, much smaller 
than the number of the ordinary people, right? So we study, psychologists, they study, they try to establish the theory. The most accountable source for them is the general public, not the elites, not elites. So that is much easier for them to come out a theory for us to understand. But the problem is that the theory is itself, the theory itself, is established by their findings from a group of ordinary persons, but not from a very, very small group of elites out there. Here is the problem, okay? And let's talk about the theory itself. Why? Why, why they are so urged to, to identify theory for us? Well, one reason for this is that the desire to construct theories that are rigorous and the parsimonious has meant that only simple beliefs can be analyzed. Simple beliefs, which means that the beliefs uphold by ordinary persons are much easier to, for the psychologists to analyze, right? Elites are more complicated. They have more concerns more interest than we can imagine. So it would be very difficult to analyze. So in this regard, we analyze ordinary people's beliefs and we try to come up with theory based on our observation on them. So this way may be the best way to produce theories that eventually will be able to explain complex thinking. But there's little reasons to expect that at their present stage of development, such theories will, will provide much assistance in understanding the ways that competent people go about making important decisions. But it's not really sufficient for us. Although we can collect data from ordinary persons, we can come up with theories for us to understand how people make decisions. But it is insufficient for us to understand the way the competent people, the people with a lot of ability to make their decision, when they make important decisions, it's still not sufficient. Thus, just like the Abbotson admits that a significant criticism of the theory that he co-authored and that often has been applied to foreign policy decision making is there are two issues here. That such his theory of foreign policy decision making gives too little scope to the possibilities of human thought. Human is magnificent in many, many ways. So, but this kind of theory gives little scope to the possibilities of human thought, even as practiced by mediocre thinkers and on the other side of the same coin, that it impedes the drawing of certain conclusions which are manifestly observed by any standard. So when we try to use a theory to understand the complexity of international relations, Sometimes we count on the theory, but if we just take a away from the theory, we find out that it is much easier for us to understand a certain issue. For example, the interactions of two persons. Of course, we can use a lot of theories to understand the interaction patterns between these two persons, right? But if we put aside the understanding and are trying to use the theories, to understand the interactions, we can just use our common sense. Maybe our common sense will tell more stories about the interactions pattern. In this case, do we need to count down theory to us to understand things? Not really, right? Not really. So basically, a theory, it is a simplified version of complex reality. When we come down a theory, come down a theory to understand the matter, then it would be very difficult for us to avoid, avoid the one thing, that is, we'll be forced to exclude 
a lot of other possibilities to understand the same issue. So it is good for us to understand, to analyze the difficult issue, complex issue in the world with theories. But when we use theories, in the meantime, we exclude ourselves to the understanding of other possibilities of the same reality. So using theory or not is a very difficult issue, right? But if we use theories come out from psychological studies, it will force us to neglect a lot of important complexities of the whole world, world affairs in the same time. So compound theories or not compound theories is a matter of choice for you, right? But most of the time, still, we need to count down, we need to rely on a certain set of theories for us to understand the world. Why? Because basically, human is limited. The world affairs are unlimited. The world affairs are so complicated. And our mindset is so limited. So still, today we still need to count down, rely on theories for us to understand what happened to the whole wide world. But a word of a warning, when we rely on theories, don't abuse it. We know it has limits. We know it has some strengths, right? But the limits and the strengths have to be coexisted there before we apply the theory to understand everything. And remember one important issue. It doesn't matter how much information you have collected, how rationally you have made up your decision, you have to assume that your decision is prone to be wrong. It is there. It is wrong. It doesn't matter how rational yet you are. You are still making wrong decisions. It happens a lot. Okay? So perception and misperception are intriguing enough, right? We try to have a correct perception. But even, even, even you have the per correct perception on certain issue, you still, you will still make some wrong decisions based on the right perception. Why? Because people have different preferences. People have different belief systems. People have different norms and values. And we have to understand this. And what is the benefit for having this understanding? Well, we can move back to the first few slides. Because this kind of knowledge can be used to help us to explain specific decisions. Why you make such a decision? And I also account for the patterns of interactions. Why people interact in this way? Why states interact in this way, right? And also to improve our general understanding of international relations. At least, if we are trying to study more about international relations, we need to know perceptions are mis and the perce misperceptions do occur in the whole wide world. We do not make the correct decisions all the time. Even we try very hard with reasons. Even, even though, okay? So this is the basic idea we need to know. Okay, and uh, let's move to etymology here. Uh, psychology, psychology. Psychology, let's look at the psych. Psych means spirit or mind, right? Uh, so if you say, if you uh, identify someone as a psycho, that is a, is a, is a crazy man, right? And uh, allergy, allergy means uh, the study of something, the study of something. So we have a biology, for example, biology, the study of life. Bio life, right? 
and uh, allergy. How about the allergy? Allergy and geo means earth. So geology is the study of the earth. Okay, so allergy cannot be used. And uh, accurately, cure. C U R A means care, right? So if you care something all the time, then it must be accurate. Accurate. And uh, for ladies, maybe you have done your manicure. Care for your hands. So if you have uh, trained your fingernails uh, in the parlor, right? Beauty shop. Then you have a manicure. Manicure. Okay, cure. And how about this curator? Curator means that a person who cares. What is the person who cares? A person who cares all the artifacts in a museum. A manager, Guan Zhang, Bo Guan Guan Zhang, curator. Okay, so this is a curator. Okay. And let's talk about the cognitive. We say that uh, no, right? So recognize you if you see it one more time, you know it one more time. That is to recognize. Distort. Tort is to twist. Twist. And uh, ambiguous. MB means both, right? And you must know this word, ambition. A status of both. So you want this and you also want that, right? So this is ambition. You want this and that, yixin. So ambition comes out from this way. Okay, so all of this is something you need to learn. And this one, desire. It's interesting. Actually, desire, S-I-R, is star. Star. So, D-E means a way or of. So look here, desire means you want something from the star, away from the star, you desire, right? right? And how about consider? Consider. Consider. Let's be wrong. Oh, no. <laughs> Consider, sorry. Consider, that's so strange. Consider means you put all the star, S I D E R is star too. So basically, you put all the star together, take a good look. So you consider, okay? Come means with or together. So you put all the stars together, so you come, see, you think over, okay? And how about this scope? Scope is a means for seeing, watching, or observing. So if you look at this telescope, teller, what is the meaning for teller? Uh, telephone, right? Phone means sound. Teller is from a distance, uh, from a distant away. So it's a very far away. So a sound from a distance means 电话. And a scope, a tool for you to observe things from afar, from a distance. It's a, some sort of it's something for you to see things afar. Wang Yuan Jing telescope. Okay? And how about microscope? Something for you to see very, very small things. Xian Wei Jing, the microscope. Okay? So all of the rules here are very useful. And there's another one I just saw it, reef. Reef, I V means river. So derive, D means away or off, right? So if you derive something, you take something from the river. So you 
take something, you retreat something, you take something from there. If you arrive, AR, the original form for AR is AD, means two. So you to the river, which means you arrive. You have to put the settings uh, in the many, many decades ago, centuries ago. When people arrive in the river, along the bank of the river, it calls a day, right? So arrive, arrive to the river. And how about arrival? R-I-V-A-L. A-L refers to people or adjective. So the same people, the different people arriving around the river. So you can see this is a river, right? And there are two people here. So basically they are rivals. They compete for the right of having the river water. So they are rivals. So they are enemies. They are competitors, rivals, OK? And let's move to uh, punctuations. Punctuations are a little bit intriguing because uh, in Chinese we learn punctuations too, right? So if you move to the next slide, you will find out these are the commonly seen English punctuations. And look here. Periods, commas, semicolons, or columns, quotation marks, parentheses, and the brackets apostrophes, hyphens, dashes, ellipses, quotation marks, question marks, and exclamation points. All of this, all of these are punctuations in English. They carry different meanings. They have different meanings. And sometimes I saw my students, I see my students writing, they will use this kind of punctuation. This is purely Chinese style, or this punctuation. It's very strange. In English, there are no such punctuations. Be careful for this. Don't use, don't mix them together. They are different. And also in Chinese, in English, they do not have a period such fact. It's not a circle over there, no. We, they do not have. So you just use a period over there. They have different meanings. It's very important. So basically, <coughs> we will have a one workshop specially designed for you to use punctuations. You will be amazed to find out how poor your knowledge about the use of punctuations in English. It, it, it's very important to use the correct punctuations. That's why we have to emphasize on this. Why? Because punctuations can help us to clarify the meanings of the passage here. For example, let's read this one. But while their work is extremely valuable for showing the importance of the subject, then we put that it is marred by five major faults. And this is the end of the sentence, right? A period indicates the end of one sentence. And comma here is required. Comma here is required. Why? There must be some reasons. We need to have a comma here. We need, okay? And also, first, we need to have a comma here. More attention is paid to emotional than <coughs> cognitive factors. And we have a period here. Wishful thinking, defense mechanism, comma, and other mother motivated discussion of reality are focused on to a relative exclusion of the problem of how even a perfect um, emotional careful person will go about drawing inferences from highly ambiguous evidence in a confusing and confused world. We have a period here. Okay, Let, let's look at the, the reasons why we need to have the punctuations here. Basically, first, when we talk about period, period is a statement for you to tell your readers, okay, this is the end of one sentence. So we have a period here, right? And what is the purpose of comma? 
we say we need to have a comma here. Why? Must be a reason. Basically, in English writing, English writing, as a writer, you have the responsibility to tell your readers, give you the hint to your readers, where is the subject in the sentence. Normally, you need to provide the subject as soon as possible in one sentence. If you cannot do this, then you need to provide a very good hint about the subject of your sentence. Why it is so important to identify the subject? Because in English writing, you always need to have a subject to make a sentence a sentence. Is that right? So a subject is very important. And let's look at the first sentence. We have a long sentence here. But while their work is extremely variable for showing the importance of the subject, right? And this is the independent clause, late by while. While the work is extremely variable, so you can see in the dependent sentence, while the work is extremely variable for showing the importance of the subject, the, the subject for the clause, dependent clause, is work. Is that right? And is variable. Okay, so basically here you can see this is a dependent variable, but still we do not see the subject for the sentence yet, right? So here we need to provide a pause, comma, pause, here, to point out the subject for the sentence. And uh, you see the comma here, you pause a bit, and uh, instantly you identify is, it is, it here is the subject. It is marred, okay? So let's take away this and then ask yourself. If the whole sentence coming out of from but two faults, will that be a little bit difficult for you to identify the subject of the sentence here? It is a little bit difficult for you, right? Now you can imagine, if all the writings in one article are constructed in this way. Can you easily understand the whole structure, the meaning of the article? It will be very difficult, right? So that's why, that's why we need to provide a post for the readers to understand the location of the subject. It's very simple, very straightforward, okay? So here, the comma is required. In the original text, in the original essay, there is no comma there. The old fashioned writing, but it is wrong. No comma there. So that's why I put a bracket over here. It means that I put over there. You need to have a comma, definitely. So the purpose of the comma is to identify, help you to identify the location of the subject. And now, let's, we have a two segment here, right? And the other segment is here. So if we change the order of the green parts and the yellow parts by this way, it is marked by five major faults while their work is extremely variable for showing the importance of the subject. If we change the order, do we need a comma? Do we need to have a comma put over here and a period over here? Do we need to have a comma here? The answer is no. No, why? Because your obligation to point out, to point out the subject is there. And uh, this whole segment, whole segment is just function like an adverb. That's it. Adverb. Adverb. 
And this adverb is to use to modify is marred. That's it. So you don't have to emphasize <coughs> emphasize the subject of the dependent clause. You don't. Unless there is an exception. Unless the dependent clause is provides a different opposite meanings for the independent clause. Normally it is led by even though or though. Okay, though. So if that is in this case, you need to put a comma to provide emphasis. Okay, so it is a little bit tricky, but it's quite easy to be understood. Basically, English punctuation is to help you to clarify the meanings of your sentences. That is the basic idea, okay? And let's look at the second one. <coughs> so first, first, you point out first, and uh, this is the argument you want to raise. You need to have a comma there. More attention, see? When we say that as a writer in, for English sentence, you have the obligation to point out the subject as soon as possible, right? So what is, when we say as soon as possible, normally, what is the norm to make it as soon as possible? Well, the normally, in the first three or four words, there must be a subject out there, normally. If that is too long, then you need to use comma to separate. Okay, normally. So first, more attention is paid to emotional than to cognitive factors. And we need to have a period here, right? So this is another sentence. First, a comma and a period. And, and let's look at another setting. Wishful thinking, comma. Defense mechanism, comma and the other motivated distortions of reality. Okay, here, let's look. Why do we need to have a comma, comma, and, uh, and we need to have a comma here? What kind of scenario, what kind of circumstances we can omit the use of comma here? There must be some reasons out there. Well, basically, basically, when we use and, when we use an, an or but, this kind of coordinative conjunctions, we have to pay attention to the lens of A, B, and C. So if we A, B, and C, right? Sometimes we will consider where do we need to put a comma in between? When? What will be the occasions? If A, B, and C are only single words, single words, then we don't need to put a comma between B and C, we don't need. But A, B, and C, if they are phrases or clauses, then we need to put a comma. Why? Because that would be easier for the readers to identify. Very simple. For the, when we write out, when we put the commas in between, the first consideration for us is to think whether, which way that the reader will be easier to understand the meaning of the sentence. So in this case, let's say, which for thinking A is a phrase, right? And defense mechanisms, another phrase. So it's long. So it would be much easier for the reader to understand there are three things connected together by N. So A, B, and other motivated distortion of reality. So we have three things up there, right? And they are long. They are long. So here we need to put a comma in between B and C. But if we change this to, let's say, here, thinking, mechanism, and uh, distortions are focused, then do we need a comma here? No, we don't. Because they are only simple words, right? 
thinking mechanism and discussion, so we should take this away for the convenience of the reader's understanding. That's it. But the original sentence is long. There are three phrase, word phrases, verbal phrases over there, right? So we, that's why we need to provide comma, comma, and something. A, B, and something. Okay? So everything, when you use punctuations, the simple consideration is how could I clarify the meanings of the sentence so that the, the readers can understand? And you have to use the uh, punctuations carefully. And of course, these are the different types of punctuations in English. And remember, they are punctuations in English, not in Chinese. Chinese way uh, have a different punctuations. Okay, so be careful. Don't mix it together. Don't confuse. And for example, in Chinese, we have a uh, we have uh, this suming hao ba, right? Underline the 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 the, 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 the book, the title of the book, and uh, saying that this is the book. And we have this, but in English they do not have this. Okay, so uh, just be careful. Be careful. Don't mix them together. It will be very very strange to to, to read. Okay, and let's talk about the assignments for today. This is a big question, basically. Why cannot we directly use psychologists' work on perceptions to improve our general understanding of international affairs? There are five major faults, right? From the laboratory, a strong policy buyers, and they do not analyze people who are friends and so on. There are some issues. So you can find the answers from the readings. And assignment number two, specialists in international relations, I'm sorry, there's a type of specialists, yes, okay. Specialists in international relations have assumed that decision makers for international relations usually perceive the word quite accurately and that those misperceptions that do occur can only be treated as random accidents. Uh, this is the assumption from the experts for international relations. While the Sturbis, the author, disagree with this statement, why? Use an example to elaborate your argument. So I want you to, basically I want you to identify the example, a real example in a wide word, okay? You can use yours, of course or some VIPs out there. It's up to you. Number three, who is Robert Everson? Well, there's a full illustration in the text, right? Okay. When he noted, just want you to uh, know him a bit. That's it. When he noted that there were plenty of cold cognitive factors producing inaccurate world views, what did he mean? Just as I point out, even if you are rational enough, you think over an issue with all the reasons, all the evidences, still you make wrong decisions, right? So what do you mean? The word is perceived quite different from people to people, right? We have our own value system to make such your own judgment. Uh, of course, we try, to, we try to make all the right decisions, but Still, we will commit errors. Uh, we can simply use a very simple self-defense uh, mechanism. That is, oh, we are all human, and human are too ill, right? And that is not easy at that. You have to think about uh, reasons why it is. So I do encourage your team to have a full discussion. And as usual, I will have a Wednesday noon for a separate course in Chinese to give you more uh, observation of mine on the structure of the lesson. And if you have any question, you can bring along with them to me so we can have a nice discussion too. Okay, I will see you uh, next, uh, next time and we'll talk about men. Okay, see you, bye-bye.